a very warm welcome to all the participants and to the speakers to this um, very important session on transformative innovation and collaboration for the Sustainable Development Goal 12, Responsible Consumption and Production at Universities. We're very pleased to welcome um, speakers from Canada, Kenya, Germany, Malaysia, Peru, and India. Uh, and thus to already have the opportunity to exchange from all the different parts of the world. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you to this webinar as part of a webinar series organized by the International Association of Universities over the last uh, year and a half. And the um, webinar series is focusing on the future of higher education. But what is the International Association of Universities? We are the global voice of higher education, um, an association, a non-governmental international organization uh, with an independent voice that has been called into life in 1950 by UNESCO and which uh, vision and mission is really to foster higher education cooperation around the world to transform society into a more sustainable one. We're to, today still an official partner of UNESCO. We have an associate status um, to this um, important organization and as well ECOSOC accreditation to the UN. And this is why this session is also very important in the context and has been registered as part of the UN high level political forum in New York. We're still based at UNESCO, but again, I want to insist on the fact that we're independent and thus we have the opportunity with the representatives of higher education from around the world to also respond to governments and to help set um, the, the pathway into the future with higher education. The membership of the International Association of Universities is global. We're very pleased to count um, the organization and institutions of our speakers as members of the International Association of Universities and to have developed um, within the context of our priority action area, higher education and research for sustainable development, a global cluster on higher education and research for sustainable development in which context we develop projects and various initiatives, publications recently and where you will find as well the opportunity to learn much more about what higher education institutions around the world do when it comes to sustainable development on a global HESD portal. This year it's the third time that we take part in the UN High Level Political Forum and this webinar is just part of a stream within the IAU webinar series but as well uh, one of the, the webinars that is reg registered officially with the UNHLPF. I'm very pleased uh, to have this conversation about SDG 12 as it is very important for the future of our societies as you will hear from the speakers. But, but without further ado, I will give the floor to my colleague Isabel Toman, who is doing much of the work in support of HESD and she will explain how um, the IAU Global Cluster on HESD is working and how we register that in the context of UN initiatives. The floor is yours, uh, Isabel. Thank you, Hilich, and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, virtual event um, which is taking place in the margins of the UN High Level Political Forum virtually this year as well. Um, I'm very pleased to be presenting a bit just very briefly the context um, of today's session and of the IAU HVSD cluster. So my uh, position as Program Officer for Higher Education and Research for Sustainable Development at the International Association of Universities. As such, I work a lot with the IAU HVSD cluster. Um, so you might wonder the cluster on HVSD that will be the panelists and that is really the core of today's session. It is a network launched in 2018 by the International Association of Universities, consisting of 16 lead universities from all world regions, leading on one of the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, and having between two and eight approximately satellite universities per subcluster. So overall in this network, we have 80 higher education institutions involved that then again work with their partners and create their own synergies. And IAU is taking the lead on SDG 17 partnerships with the coordinator role, giving a platform, organizing events such as this one, 
uh, really with one common goal to bring these sustainable development goals and to bring them closer to higher education um, and to together work for a more sustainable future for our planet. The UN High Level Political Forum, on the other hand, is the United Nations mechanism to follow up on Agenda 2030, which comprises the 17 um, sustainable development goals and their sub-targets. And this is being reviewed every year. So the High Level Political Forum, which is taking place, it started last week until mid this week. So until tomorrow, we have still government discussions going on in New York, but mainly virtually at the United Nations that are following up on voluntary national reviews, countries progress, but also include stakeholder groups such as academia, science, NGOs, and having all these special events and virtual events that are following up on it. So really we are trying to also advocate in the cluster for the role of higher education to governments and other groups and other partners, but we're also trying with the institutions, the universities to share our knowledge, to exchange, and um, to have a network effect that we need to make progress, to have a whole institution approach to our work. And I think our panelists will explain that and give very great details of their day-to-day -day work in a bit. This is just for an overview, the IAU Global Cluster on Higher Education and Research for Sustainable Development. So you see we have all the 16 SDGs and 17 IAU with the different subcluster groups. And we have SDG 12, Sustainable, uh, responsible um, consumption and production led by Luther College and the University of Regina and the great partners that we will have today here, Moi University from Kenya, Fechter University from Germany, Universidad del Bosque in Colombia, Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, University Saints Malaysia and University of Galaya Sri Lanka are all part of this group. And again, um, Sorry, this is the map of all the partners that we will have represented today. Apart from two partners, all could be joining us live um, and will be on the panel. So um, I very much look forward to that. And I would give it back to um, Hillage now so she can introduce our moderator. And um, thank you. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Uh, this uh, will be a very. This is again a very promising moment in the uh, in the life of the cluster, with uh, very strong discussions to come. That will be those will be uh, moderated by Zinaida Fadiva. Zinaida Fadiva is currently a visiting professor at the Center for Global Sustainability Studies at the Science uh, University of Malaysia. She has taught sustainability at a number of universities in China, in Japan, in India, and in Sweden. She's been associated with uh, many uh, international organizations and recently with the Terry School for Advanced Studies, SAS, uh, where she also visit has been a visiting professor. And she's also uh, an advisor to the in program and called um, Empretech, inspiring entrepreneurship programs at uh, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. So she wears many hats. She's also been very much involved with uh, UNIDO, with UNIAS on the development of uh, regional centers of excellence, where we met on several occasions um, at uh, UNEP and UNDP. So she's well versed in the in the world of uh, of the UN and where things happen when it comes uh, also to the development of uh, a better sustainable future. But none of that can happen without strong education uh, globally and in particular higher education and thus I'm very pleased to give you the floor Zinaida, Zinaida uh, to uh, lead us into a very fruitful conversation today. Thank you very much Ilic. Uh, I shall uh, start with warm welcome to all of the uh, panelists as well as uh, to all of the uh, attendees joining us online. Uh, we can see already now very warm greetings from, uh, from those which are listening to us. And we are also very hopeful that uh, you would use this chat, chat function uh, to put some views, share some experience, and of course, uh, post some questions to, uh, to the panelists as a group or to individual. Uh, presenter. So it would be very little of the individual presentation in the conventional sense. Uh, we will try to use the presentation, uh, the slides to the minimum. 
uh, and really bring it into more flowing uh, contexts, uh, seeing how universities are advancing uh, the world of knowledge and learning and change towards building back better from current crisis, but also aspiring by, um, of course, uh, the whole uh, agenda 2030, this focus on SDG 12. Now, it is a great pleasure to uh, introduce at this point, uh, very, very generally, uh, the uh, five of the panelists. Uh, I will give them a little bit more um, uh, time to present themselves, but also say a bit more about them when they individually come and share their experiences with us. But you could see uh, the incredible spread of experiences here in front of you. Uh, we have representatives from uh, Africa, from Americas, from Europe, from uh, Asia. So the whole major e regions are with us. Uh, if, you, if you look at the background of our presenters, you would have, again, the whole spread from people working in the area of philosophy to the engineers, to those which are heading uh, the uh, centers dealing with global sustainability or those which are very much focusing on the uh, regional or local sustainability. And in addition to uh, Hilich, as you mentioned, uh, being members of the uh, IU SDG 12 uh, cluster of the university, leading one and inspiring this area, of course, they are uh, well connected with some other uh, international uh, programs and uh, networks. For example, three of our uh, presenters, uh, Roger Petri, uh, Detlef Lander Bank, and Saidatul Mott, uh, are working with regional centers of expertise on education for sustainable development. And by this connection, are uh, also uh, uh, representing a, a rather large network which exists since uh, 2005 uh, and which is close uh, now nearing the 200 uh, members networks of networks in different parts of the globe so it is an incredible uh, wealth of experience and we will be trying to focus on uh, essentially four uh, uh, questions isabel if you could just bring them very briefly uh, on the screen uh, those questions are related to um uh, to innovations and changes which university represented by our panelists uh, uh, have been going through uh, recently as well as uh, for, uh, for a few years before uh, the current challenging times. Uh, we will of course specifically focus on the role of uh, Agenda 2030 SDG and how SDG 12 uh, is taken up by institutional strategy and action of those universities. We will look at how the, the entire setup of their uh, universities uh, is built around the notion of whole institutional approach and how it helps uh, for the uh, university to become more effective. And of course, uh, we will discuss opportunities and barriers which uh, our colleagues have uh, encountering in becoming change agents in the SDG 12 areas. And with this, uh, let me very uh, brief, uh, well, uh, briefly turn the floor to our first presenter, uh, who is Roger Petri. He is professor of philosophy at Luther College of the University of Regina. He's uh, he's co-coordinator RC or Regional Center of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development, Saskatchewan, in Canada. And very notably and relevant for this discussion, he is of course the uh, coordinator of the um, of the SDG 12 uh, cluster under the IU. Uh, Roger, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you so much, Sunita. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody and say good morning from Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, the University of Regina is situated on treaties four and six, the lands of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Dakota First Nations, and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, today, I'd like to say a few words of introduction about why universities are so central at this time to advancing new sustainable production and consumption systems, and why a whole institution approach is so valuable to provide a bit of strategic context for the work that we are doing. So uh, I'm a philosopher, so I always like asking questions. And the one question I ask, why should we see universities as so central at this time? 
for this uh, because there are a lot of other organizational players. Uh, well, one of the reasons is historic. Uh, when we need to, to move to new production systems, uh, whether it's with the rise of science and the move to the Industrial Revolution or the rise of the humanities and the rise of towns and cities in Europe, uh, it was the universities that led the way. Uh, so historically, we have that precedent. Uh, universities are in the business of innovation. A lot of organizations have serious resource constraints right now. Uh, our resources are always applied to innovation. Uh, we're here to serve. Universities are, are often state universities or serve their communities in various ways. So our accountability is for transformation of our communities. And lastly, we are autonomous. We can ask the hard questions and come up with the creative solutions that are desperately needed uh, at this time. Now, I guess the second point is why a whole institution approach? All right, so if you recall, UNESCO defined a whole institution approach as one that encompasses mainstream, mainstreaming sustainability into all aspects of the learning environment, which includes embedding sustainability, not only in curriculum and learning processes, but in our facilities and operations, as well as our interactions with the surrounding community and our governance and our capacity building. So, so that's what's meant by a whole institution approach um, and when we think about sustainable consumption and production, uh, as scholars, we do that in our scholarly outputs, but we also do it in the way our universities run as organizations. And critically, a whole institution approach is a source of innovation, because what it means is we're crossing the barriers between disciplines and between our academic staff and our non-academic staff and between the university as an ivory tower and the community. And so that's where the innovation comes in through a whole university approach. And so when we chose members of this cluster, we chose universities that were of a sufficient size, that they had the diversity of disciplines, as well as uh, not too big, that they didn't work together uh, across our campuses. Um, the other thing I think that the whole institution approach does is we care about the whole institution, which means we see our members of this cluster not as competitors, but as collaborators and as cooperators. And you'll see that in the presentations today. Um, the other thing I think I would say is that uh, when why, we, why Sustainable Development Goal 12 is so important uh, is that when we think about it, our production and consumption systems are cross-cutting. Cross Right? They cut across our universities in, and our disciplines, and so they enable the integration we're looking for by focusing on that. Um, a whole institution approach is also embedded in the cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach of responsible consumption and production. And if we go back to the high-level political forum uh, a few years back, Sustainable Development Goal 12 was seen as the heart of the SDGs. Why? Because it impacts the social uh, goals of the SDGs, whether it's around poverty or well-being, uh, sustainable cities, the economic goals around decent work and industrial innovation, and our ecological goals around climate change, around sustaining life on land and in water, and around clean water. So, so we've got that important role of SDG 12 as bringing together the other SDGs. Uh, just a bit about what do we need to know and value <laughs> to advance the SDG 12 on our campuses. I think the idea that we need to bring across all of our scholarly methods across the university to be brought to bear on this issue because we don't know where the innovation is coming from. But a whole institution approach also talks about culture. So uh, you'll hear that when we talk about this, we're talking about the values and the ethics of sustainability brought to bear on our day-to-day -day patterns of livelihood and lifestyle on our campuses and seeing how that can transform our campuses. So how do we apply this new knowledge and value system? Right? Why is it SDG 12 is so critical to, to universities through a whole institution approach? Well, it's because our universities through these, this cluster are living laboratories, all right? And that means that we can transform ourselves in terms of our physical infrastructure. Uh, we can work with our communities, and Ida mentioned the RCE network as a way of uh, 
transforming our communities as laboratories themselves, but these aren't artificial laboratories. These are living. These are laboratories with energy, with resources, with systems that doesn't require us having to rebuild a lot of new things, but tweaking and, and altering maybe in small interventions that have huge impacts. And so uh, in my last 48 seconds, I guess I would say that if we think about the ability of our universities to customize our production and consumption systems to our local ecosystems, to our local livelihood patterns, in order to build on the synergies of that energy within those systems, we can then see how a global linking of those uh, innovations enables us to scale up our local innovation. So in many ways, what we're doing through this cluster is sharing recipes, not necessarily formulas, but ways of doing things that we can customize to our local systems and at the same time transform our production and consumption in terms of trade, for example, and new products and services. So, uh, so I think you'll hear there's a lot of excitement with uh, the other speakers today, but I think that gives us a context about why the universities are so important at this time and why this cluster, I think, is so important at this time. So thank you, Zaneda. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Roger, I hope that uh, a bit more insights um, about activity of your university and its action in the community could be uh, shared a bit uh, later. But what is very important, uh, colleagues, uh, in what Roger you are saying is uh, that in addition to explaining the motivation for this cluster and how we see our role and ambition, uh, you emphasize exactly um, what is a unique space of university in the existing context. Uh, in the situation, especially when on the one hand, innovations are incredibly called upon and required for getting again out of the pa pandemic crisis and uh, out of the uh, unsustainability crisis. But at the same time, on the other hand, resources are admittedly scarce. So, uh, and this is what puts a uh, university, as you explained, in an incredibly important position. And it also highlights, you also highlight some of the principles of organizational operations that allow uh, higher education institution innovations. And this is reference uh, which you made to the whole institution approach and also to the whole society approach, isn't it? So uh, globally as well as nationally. And so, as well as ability to bring together maybe perspective of different sectors and disciplines. And I, I am absolutely sure that our next speakers would start showing how it's been done in their individual context. And it, it gives me a pleasure to introduce uh, Ross uh, Ramkat. Uh, now Ross is a lecturer and Dep deputy center leader of a center of excellence in petrochemicals textile and renewable energy. You can hear again, uh, Roger mentioned he's a philosopher here. We get the whole spread of expertise through Ross and her uh, colleagues at Moy University in Kenya. Ross, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Zineida. And uh, to enhance on what uh, Roger has mentioned in relation to Moy University, which is found in Kenya and at the Center of Excellence, we have been focusing a lot on activities of SDG 12. And a lot of things actually that we have been doing, I've been focusing on seeing how we can enhance knowledge in our communities and moving away from the university from being an ivory tower to implementing activities and innovations we are doing at the community. To start with, at Moi University at the Center of Excellence, we are working on renewable energy and we have um, established a biogas unit at the institution whereby we want to see how we can utilize the waste products or um, in an efficient manner. And here we are using the waste products and foods from the kitchens to feed the biodigester. And in return, we are using the gas to cook and the bio slurry goes back to the farm. In a circular manner, it raises the crops, and foods that come back again to the kitchen, you know, for cooking and everything. In this manner, we see a circularity and sustainability in terms of uh, utilization of all resources fully. And at, at the same time, we see how organically we can manage our environment and the foods we eat. 
So what we have done at the university is that we have tried now to move out with this knowledge to the community and to the society. So we have started to impact in the community surrounding the institution. We have trained on the community farmers and the, the neighborhood to start to use this biogas. And we find that some of the small farmers have started putting up small digesters in their homestead. And for the purpose of sustainability in the future, we thought it is wise as an institution to start to train our young thugs or the young youths on how to manage the environment by coming up with sustainable you know, energy utilization. And we picked focal institutions uh, which are in high school level and we started training these schools in relation to how to utilize biogas. And we have already trained uh, four schools and one as so we have completed the renovation and construction of biogas units. And this biogas is now being used by the schools in the laboratory and in the kitchen to cook. So in a way, we are already demonstrating to the young environment, young youth, any biogas is a sustainable way to go. And if they do this, we can be able to, you know, to have sustainability in the environment, given that a lot of schools in Kenya have been cooking using firewood and so on. So in a way, we try to now show sustainability of managing the environment by planting more trees. And at the same time, we are using our ways to, you know, continue cooking. Initiatives also and innovations have been going on in our university. One key major thing that we need to note is that more university has a textile factory, and this is a factory that is used for teaching and research at the same time and for commercial purpose for the university. So we focus a lot on the textile sector, particularly at the center, and textile is one major area that if not quite well managed, it is easy to get a lot of pollutions in the environment, given that a lot of chemicals that are used in the textile sector are mainly petrochemicals. And how have we come up as an institution to try and solve these challenges? We've been doing a lot and a lot of research and innovations in relation to using natural dyes, and we are focused on using natural dyes deemed to be weeds or to have no value or economical value, not tree plants which maintain the environment, but plants that the farmers can, you know, need to remove from their farms, or even waste produce from food factories, for, ins for instance, uh, potato peels, or even uh, waste from coconut husks. And this way, we have them to produce a uh, useful natural dyes, which have gone back to the factory used in dyeing our natural uh, our fabric. So now in a manner, we have a sustainable manner of producing dyes that are not harmful to the environment, and the users. And in this particular way, we have tried to move this type of training again to the community. And we have trained a uh, small and medium enterprise uh, people on how to use these natural dyes to to try and dye their fabrics. So people who are doing the business of printing and you know, uh, in the community have now picked up this technology and they are using it to dye their, um, their goods and what they're producing. And with this, we are aiming to reach more and to assist them to reach more beneficial and global markets because the global market now is looking at more natural ways of doing things in a sustainable manner. So through this, we want to assist the community to reach out to bigger markets in a better and sustainable way, in a way that is acceptable to everybody. So again, how have we come up on this SDG? We have looked at enabling the community to produce more and more natural products. And at more University, we've trained the community of production of natural soap. So this soap, we have used, we, we have shown them how to produce soap at this particular era, and this has been quite important at this era of COVID, whereby the communities we've trained to produce natural soap are now in a sustainable manner producing soap for their own use at home to manage the COVID pandemic and also send it to their community, their neighborhoods, and this way they get a source of living and livelihood. So there's a lot and a lot of things that we are doing. And one key uh, project of our university currently is on fruit farming. And we know the role of trees in managing the environment. As Rogers, we notice that a lot of our institutions, particularly in Africa, we have a lot of area and space, which is well utilized and again, enable sustainability of the environment. And maybe in this particular way, when we have planted these fruit trees, you will find that there is high potential that at the end of it, you will be supplying you know, fruits for food, uh, food security. 
At the same time, these uh, trees can act in terms of carbon sequestering. At the end of it, lock a lot of carbon and therefore manage the climate changes that are occurring. Therefore, the nether, there are a lot and a lot of things that we are doing at the institution. And maybe at this time, I would post there and give time to another speaker, then we will come back when we interact the other questions on AGP. Thank you and back to you, Nader. Thank you very much, Ross. Uh, there are excellent examples of at least three points which we are talking about. Uh, first of all, of course, the whole institution approach, how the overall SCP strategy of the university officially accepted is being translated into operations uh, such as through procurement, education, through different new courses, and the research uh, combined with community action. Uh, of course, the second point, uh, clearly what you mentioned, is connection to a variety of SDGs, con connecting uh, SCP with, uh, or SDG 12 with areas of food security, energy security, with efficiency, with sustainable livelihood, etc. And third point, uh, which is remarkable really, is how the university shares resources which are traditionally controlled by the university with, uh, with the community, uh, which is really very interesting perspective on shared economy or uh, shared goods, uh, local goods and while well, contributing to the um, uh, global uh, public goods. So excellent points. Uh, I hope that it triggers interest uh, of our uh, listeners uh, who I encourage to share their examples or references to their examples as well as uh, please do keep posting questions uh, to our uh, speakers. Uh, thank you very much, Ross. Uh, hopefully more uh, reflections from you would be coming during the discussion of the questions. And that brings me uh, to Europe. Let's stay with this, the same time dimension, or <laughs> at least. And then the, the flow goes uh, to uh, Detlef Lindau Bank, uh, who is a good and long-term colleague he is assistant professor and researcher at Vechta University in Germany. He is also a coordinator of RCE Oldenburger Musterland. And this RCE and the university do an incredible job in the area of SCP. Uh, also, uh, in a sense, giving an, a, inspiration to other regional centers of expertise in Europe, how to engage uh, local uh, entrepreneurs uh, and innovators uh, and put them into better position to contribute to more sustainable supply chains. Uh, Detlef, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zinaida. Thank you very much for mentioning that we are working uh, a long time together since uh, two 2008, uh, I know Zinaida. Uh, and uh, let me start with a story. Um, as I started in um, Fechter at the university um, with my work, uh, it was uh, in 1998, 23 years ago. Uh, and uh, I started with uh, um, uh, education for sustainable development because I thought it's an important uh, uh, um, uh, topic and uh, it has to be a uh, part of uh, uh, of any stu uh, study program in Fechter. And uh, it lasts nearly 10 years that we start at the University um, of Fechter um, our um, sustainable uh, sustainability program in the sense of uh, a whole institution approach. But that's not the clue of the story. The clue of the story is that I... I was looking for partners in Germany to create a, a sustainable university and uh, to create networks on education for sustainable development. And uh, the UNESCO in Germany um, provided a map and I looked an institution, a partner in Fechter. And um, I looked it up and it was my colleague in another uh, department and he was work or she was working 
um, for sustainable development for nearly the same time, but we do not know each other. And uh, I think that's, uh, uh, that's the most important um, effect and uh, the most important uh, thing of uh, the whole institution approach to bring the colleagues uh, uh, together and, uh, uh, and share the information, the um, projects and whatever. So, and um, in 2009, we started uh, to, um, yeah, to create the University of Fechter as a sustainable uh, um, university. And uh, then it lasts nearly five, six years um, that we uh, have, um, thanks to our uh, president uh, at the time, that we um, and have um, um, fixed an objective uh, uh, agreement or a goal agreement uh, to, uh, with the state of the Lower Saxony. So the, our state of uh, Lower Saxony now supports our university in, uh, in acting for sustainable development and, uh, uh, and um, we have the opportunity to show uh, our excellence and uh, as uh, in our objective agreement, it is uh, mentioned, uh, our university tries to um, advocate for culture of sustainability. So, and uh, that's, uh, I think, the uh, second point of, uh, of the whole institution ex, uh, uh, approach and, uh, um, and an answer to, uh, to the question, what, uh, to what extent are Agenda 2030 and SDGs used in an institutional strategy? Uh, we do not uh, only share information, we try to uh, create a culture, and that means uh, to uh, uh, to discuss and reflect on our values and what is important or what not. Uh, but uh, this work needs uh, uh, needs a framework and uh, to build up this uh, framework uh, and to fulfill our target agreement, a sustainability officer was appointed. Um, and he is also an advisory member of the extended presidium. And so he is close to uh, in, uh, in to uh, to the persons in our in university uh, who decide uh, in, uh, who makes the decisions uh, of the future of our uh, in our university and we formulate sustainability guidelines starting with the uh, 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 target agreement uh, we start, we have to make it more concrete and uh, the sustainability guidelines should to cover all uh, all fields and uh, all um, departments and science which are uh, uh, at our university and uh, that was a little bit tricky uh, to uh, to get agree uh, to get it agreed in our university so what are uh, the important uh, action fields uh, and uh, some are easy uh, were easy agreed uh, for for example teaching and studies of course that's a uh, uh, important field of uh, our university of every university and uh, uh, in line with the global action program uh, the principles of education for sustainable development uh, are to be anchored more strongly in teaching and studies in order to enable students to think and act responsibly in this regard. That's the idea of, uh, uh, of our guideline. And, uh, um, and then uh, we, uh, uh, we ask ourselves what is to do. And uh, uh, for example, we, uh, uh, we build uh, appropriate course uh, contents and formats in all uh, subjects and studies. Uh, and uh, this is a process uh, which uh, is not finished yet, but uh, uh, we tried and uh, um, I think after four years, we could say that in every uh, study, we uh, the students came con in contact with the uh, topics uh, of sustainable development and of the uh, uh, special SDGs. So, um, uh, and we um, looked uh, uh, a specific uh, 
a study program which uh, only deals with uh, education for sustainable development, but this is not an official program, it's more uh, further training. Uh, then um, the second uh, action field uh, is uh, research. Uh, which means on the one hand uh, that our university supports research on sustainable related issues that serve to generate system knowledge. Of course, knowledge about relationships and mechanism uh, in different systems uh, like ecological systems or cultural, social, uh, economic systems. And um, it's about generating target knowledge, so knowledge about the uh, different uh, SDGs. And last but not least, we uh, try to enhance uh, transformation uh, knowledge, uh, concrete change processes. And that is something what we do with our partners uh, in our region and our national or international partners. On the other hand, a research project should be oriented towards the aspects of sustainable development in terms of objectives and implementation. So how, uh, mm, how to make a sustainable development real in the different uh, um, areas uh, where our mm, colleagues uh, uh, are active. So, uh, and now it was uh, uh, something about um, or the, the action fields we then uh, figure out, uh, they were uh, really uh, discussed and uh, I think uh, some parts, uh, some colleagues uh, are not agreeing to this, but we uh, uh, say one important part is living sustainability on campus. So, and uh, uh, that means that we strive for environmentally friendly, resource efficient, family and gender fair, inclusive, health promoting and diverse campus uh, uh, activities and operations. Um, uh, and uh, we try to act as a role model, model. And this term, we want to act as a role model. This was really, uh, discussed because of uh, uh, many uh, of uh, very engaged uh, colleagues said, no, uh, we are not a role model when we, uh, for example, attend uh, conferences uh, in, in other countries and uh, we have a deep ecological footprint and so on. Uh, so what is a role model? And so living sustainability on campus is the most uh, lively uh, discussed uh, uh, part of our um, of our uh, action fields, and then. Um, Detlef, uh, uh, may I just yeah. ask you to uh, uh, continue sharing this incredibly important actions uh, in depth uh, uh, during the focus on particular uh, questions? For example, you you will you uh, will of course. You will bring me uh, to an end. Thank you very much, uh, Zinaida. I will do. Uh, and uh, so let me uh, uh, only uh, name that we have then uh, noch cooperation uh, and networking uh, as an action field and um, uh, and to come to an end and uh, to make conclude. Um, this, uh, uh, this guidelines um, uh, uh, are the, um, uh, the content of our uh, our um, regular um, uh, 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 sustainability report, and in this report, we are uh, uh, we have two things uh, uh, which goes uh, goes ahead. Uh, one part is that we are uh, trying to uh, uh, to show this, uh, uh, the status of our uh, of our visions and of our future ideas, and um, uh, and uh, we assess uh, very concretely uh, what we are doing to uh, reach. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, the goals of the agenda 2030, what for example means uh, that we try to uh, get uh, uh, climate neutral uh, until 2030. So, and uh, behind this assessment, uh, there's a discussion now about what are the processes we 
uh, we have to create and we have to uh, assess and uh, about the processes I will talk a little bit later if I have the the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Zinada. You know me. You have to stop me. <laughs> Thank you. So I have. I'm so interested in your uh, experiences that I have a difficulty to do it. You know it as well. Uh, <laughs> I so, know. but I I would be happy to uh, bring you back these reflections about different processes. Uh, uh, at, at certain points of the discussion and clearly with your presentation as uh, with uh, reflections from Ross from Moy University, uh, you demonstrate clearly focus on the whole institution approach and also on community engagement, engagement with partners which help uh, facilitate change or who are seeking change, uh, isn't it? And uh, that naturally has uh, to take time and this is one of the, so to speak, perceived barriers, but it is also fact of life that we need to live with that. And some insights how to facilitate those processes, you would be certainly able to, uh, to uh, share uh, during the later part of the discussion. Thank you very much, Detlef. And that uh, brings okay. us to, uh, to Asia now. And uh, Professor Saida Tumot uh, is our next uh, speaker. Uh, she's associated with professor and director of the Center for Global Sustainability Studies. Ilich, I have been associated with the center before and not uh, anymore, but we maintain good professional relations. Uh, so now my association is with Nalanda University in India. So, but we remain good colleagues and um, uh, I'm certainly very happy that uh, Professor Saida too joins uh, this cluster as one of the new uh, newer uh, members of this community. Uh, Professor Saida too, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Zinaida. Uh, good evening from Malaysia, everyone, and good day to uh, the rest of the world. Thank you to uh, SDG 12 cluster, Dr. Hilije and Isabel for organizing this particular session. It is definitely a pleasure for me to share some of the initiatives that have been done at uh, University of Science Malaysia, USM, on SDG 12, as well as some other related SDGs. I'm happy to note that uh, some of the things that had been done and mentioned by Detlef as well as Rose are quite similar to what we have adopted here in USM. But first, let me uh, introduce to everyone how sustainability is embedded in the fabric of the university at USM. Sustainability in USM is part of us. It is uh, within the USM because it's already part of our vision. So the vision of the university is basically transforming education for sustainable tomorrow. So whatever we do, we try to make sure that we do not compromise the environment and we make sure that we are in line with our vision and mission to make sure that you know whatever knowledge that we transform or whatever knowledge that we uh, pass to the community and to our students will be able to be used in a sustainable manner. With that uh, note, in uh, USN, we also have a special portfolio, the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Sustainability, that is supposed to uh, be involved in planning and positioning the sustainability agenda in USM. So that is why in 2008, the university has introduced a concept called University in the Garden. I think Zenaida can still remember, you know, we have these green trees, big trees along uh, USM. So these are the concept that we want to uh, try to embed. Um, we want to make sure that we have a sustainable lifestyle, sustainable living within the campus, making sure that we have a good relationship uh, with the environment, so whatever that we do uh, with regard to our research, teaching, learning, community engagement, it has to make sure that we preserve the green campus as part of our effort in developing a knowledgeable society. So um, from that particular idea of university in the garden, we then come up with the concept of uh, campus sejahtera or healthy campus. So healthy campus is um, considered a unique innovation that was introduced in USM by our then uh, vice chancellor. This is basically a concept that brings together the whole community of the university, the administrators, the academics, students, as well as communities surrounding the university 
to work together responsibly in maintaining and emphasizing on sustainable uh, campus. So we also have our center, this my center, Center for Global Sustainability Studies, that uh, help and assist uh, the university to uplift and to enhance the uh, sustainability agenda. I would say um, when you talk about Healthy Campus, many would say that uh, Healthy Campus is a student-led organization. And it is undoubtedly that you know, students are basically the key points and uh, the key big uh, backbones of any sustainability programs or activities at university. I would like to share with all of you um, part of the uh, environmental activism flagship that we had that was done by the student and we called it the White Coffin Project. Why is it called White Coffin? Because you know this is a, a campaign that uh, banned the use of polystyrene at the university. So when they, when the students actually did their promotion and awareness program, the polystyrene was portrayed as a coffin. So if you use it, you know it will lead to a a, a more dangerous and a more uh, negative implications of the the consumption to the environment. So the white coffin project was one of the uh, most tremendous uh, flagship program that became the uh, important uh, breath of uh, SDG 12 consumption, uh, responsible consumption and production at the university. So it was not an easy move uh, to make sure that the whole uh, community at USM actually engage and buy in the idea of no polystyrene. It took efforts you know, discussions and um, uh, negotiation among the students with the top management, especially with the uh, cafeterias operators. So uh, in 2008, what happened was we banned the use of polystyrene on campus. So no more polystyrene on campus, either in cafeterias or any events that require um, catering services. So no more that. So Following from that particular project, then you know what we had then continued was our zero plastic campaign. So we have no polystyrene, no plastic flowers, no plastic bags, and no plastic straws. So when I first took office at CGS, as I was reminded by my staff, so no buying plastic plants and all these things, so that we inculcate that particular behavior in our uh, daily living. We have a long way to go, definitely. Um, you know, but uh, this is one of the steps that we take. And now if you come to USM, we now use uh, biodegradable containers. And in fact, it's just a few weeks ago that the students started to have a talk to promote a campaign on bringing their own containers uh, to campus. So the students are also thinking about engaging as vendors as well as suppliers for the containers to make sure that you know, these particular uh, programs could be undertaken at a longer time period in the university. So that's what uh, the students have done. So with regard to uh, teaching, for example, you know, uh, as a university that emphasizes on sustainability, we make sure that all our courses have some elements on sustainability. So we encourage uh, lecturers to embed sustainability and we even try to monitor on how much or what are the percentages of sustainability components that are taught uh, on um, the uh, curriculum or the courses that are offered at the university. We also have one uh, white course university on sustainability that provides students with a brief introduction about sustainable development, making sure that they are aware about what to do. And at the end of the course, students are being exposed to uh, a real project, turning waste into wealth, where they would later be able to apply it in the real world. And if they plan to become an entrepreneur, for example, they will be able to engage in sustainability um, activities or sustainability entrepreneurship. With regard to um, research, because you know we we uh, use the framework of education for sustainable development (ESD), you have community research as well as learning. So, with research, um, we have a specific um, research cluster on solid waste management research cluster, or short form for SWARM. So, this is a research cluster that was. Uh, set up by a group of academics from the School of Engineering, but it is a multidisciplinary research trying to solve few uh, multifaceted uh, problems with regard to uh, waste management. So we try to do that. Uh, we try to embed um, all sustainability elements, uh, especially on waste management and SDG 12 in all our uh, fabric in teaching, learning, as well as research and community engagement as well. And I think I will discuss more about that when we go to the next round. 
this is where I stop and uh, give way to the other presenters. Thank you so much, Zinaida. Thank you very much, uh, Saida Tool. Uh, another important example on development of institutional leadership and coordination. I think one of the or two of the questions uh, in the chat uh, specifically refer uh, to the importance of it. Uh, as in your case, you mentioned one of the uh, vice chancellors specifically entrusted with sustainability portfolio and a title. So it's one of the interesting. Uh, coordination or leadership, if you want, innovation. And also a very interesting example, and uh, also historically with long development on the role of universities laboratory for new practices. And thank you for bringing the latest examples on uh, waste management. Uh, and late, later innovations are, of course, bringing different um, Sec, uh, uh, different departments into this kind of discussions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we come yet to another time, time zone and uh, continent. Uh, Jan Velasquez Rove uh, will take uh, the uh, virtual actual microphone. Uh, Jan is uh, uh, representing Peruvian life cycle assessment and industrial ecology network, which I assume Jan brings you in touch also not only with the university partners, uh, but to large extent also with industries as well as government as uh, it is rather uh, critical uh, element of play um, in the area of SCP. And uh, you also represent the Department of Engineering in Polytechnic Universidad uh, Católica de, del Peru. Uh, Jan, the floor is yours. Many thanks, uh, Zinaida. Uh, thank you for, for your kind presentation. And well, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in today's uh, debate. It's, it's a real honor to be here representing my university. And well, uh, what you can see behind me is uh, the campus in the in the foreground is the campus of uh, the Pontifical Catholic University of uh, Peru, which is located in central Lima, more or less. It's a city of uh, 12 million uh, people on the on the Pacific coast in Peru. And uh, well, uh, as uh, Zinaida mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, I'm part of the Peruvian Life Cycle Assessment and Industrial Ecology Network, which is a, a research group within the university that also uh, collaborates with uh, researchers in other universities of, of the country. No? So, well, uh, this is an interesting trivial fact that uh, not many people know. But uh, uh, Lima is actually the uh, driest capital city in the world. Um, it's got the lowest rainfall of all capital cities that you can imagine. And uh, this rainfall is usually below 15 millimeters per year. So you might get occasional drizzles in the summer or in the, in the winter, but most of the time you just get uh, no rainfall at all. At all no? So um, this is uh, something very particular, especially for a city that has grown a lot in the last uh, 20, 25 years, and uh, has become one of the few mega cities in, in the Americas. No? So um, in, this, in this scenario, uh, 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 my university has managed to um, little by little become a leading actor uh, in, in the Peruvian context uh, when dealing with uh, sustainable uh, development goals. No? So uh, initially, uh, PUCP was a university that didn't really have a, a, an environmental policy. And this was uh, mainly due to the fact that we do not have, a, we, we did not have about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, specific careers that were environmentally oriented. You know, we had law, we had humanities, we had some engineering careers, etc. But what we realized about eight or nine years ago is that despite the fact that we didn't have these careers, we did have a very competitive research groups in environmental sciences. No? So um, this is um, somewhat unusual, but uh, at, at least in, in in Latin America, but uh, we started building a capacity building and new careers uh, oriented towards environmental sciences based on an, on an initial uh, uh, strong pillars in terms of, of, of these research groups. No? 
So according to some of the international rankings that come out on SDGs, uh, we uh, are very good in SDG 6, well, at least in the Peruvian context and Latin America, SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation. This is critical for a country, as I mentioned, uh, Lima has a strong water scarcity. We have uh, difficulties in uh, maintaining the, the demand for water in the city. And this is also something that's extendable to most of the Peruvian coast, which is high priority. Uh, SDG 7 has also been point, pointed out as something in which we, in which we perform well uh, in terms of affordable energy. And we've got a Grupo, which is a research center that uh, is specialized on uh, uh, producing uh, innovative technology for uh, renewable energies in uh, rural areas. And then we've got uh, SDG 14, which is climate action. No? So uh, we've had a... Uh, uh, a lot to say in, in SDG 14, uh, COP for, uh, 20 in Lima in 2014 was a trigger for us to, to kind of become more uh, um, influent in, in governance and in, in policy support in terms of the climate, uh, uh, climate support and climate action. And uh, most recently, uh, we've also become uh, increasingly uh, um, influential in two other sustainable development goals. One is SDG 12, which is uh, the main core of what we are discussing today, you know, which is sustainable consumption and production, in which uh, we actually, uh, a big campus, as you can see behind, we are around 100, 100 acres of land uh, in a very chaotic and big mega city. So uh, we have the policy of trying to apply a small scale sustainable uh, consumption and production policies within the university and then slowly try to generate uh, hubs at a district level and then at a citywide level in order to be able to uh, slowly generate a domino effect that uh, can generate this. No? Uh, this does not always work. We've, we've had some failures that I, I have to admit, but um, I think a very good example in which we've had some success is in single-use plastic. You know? So our campus was innovative in uh, scrapping all single-use plastic in canteens, cafeterias, and everything related to to uh, to food and uh, and all that. Then we had a second phase in which we tried to minimize as much as possible in other administrative uh, uh, sections. And uh, slowly we generated a domino effect that uh, in, in a first uh, uh, period uh, allowed us to convince a few districts in the city to bring out legislation to eliminate or minimize the use of single use plastic. And that uh, finally derived in uh, a national law that was uh, approved uh, in 2019, which uh, regulates uh, uh, the use of single-use plastics and has become one of the leading uh, policies in Latin America. No? Now, uh, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a bit of um, a barrier uh, to fully advance in, in, in this law and making and making. A, this uh, uh, something that is a part of the likelihood of Peruvians on a daily basis because, well, as you know, uh, COVID-19 has had a huge impact in, in Peru. We are currently the ca country that has a highest uh, mortality rate uh, in the world. You know? So this has obviously led to uh, very strict restrictions and uh, some uh, policies that uh, may seem too far-fetched in certain contexts. The one of these is the recovery of plastic in deliveries and all this that has definitely uh, been um, a hiccup no? in, 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 in this uh, single-use plastic banning policies that were, the way we've been, been performed in the country. Now, I also mentioned COVID-19 because uh, uh, we've also had a key role in SDG number four, which is a... Uh, uh, um, education. No? So uh, we were able to virtualize the university. Uh, well, we were supposed to start the, the 2020 academic year on March 16th, which was when we went into complete lockdown. And we were the first uh, university in the country that managed to go virtual. We went virtual on April 6th. And uh, ever since we've been supporting first uh, public universities and then uh, a lot of uh, public high schools and uh, middle schools 
in uh, undergoing the own process of uh, virtualization, no? which is uh, critical since uh, there's no face-to-face -face education in Peru ever since uh, March 16th, 2020. No? Uh, there has been in the last couple of weeks, two, three, four weeks, some rural schools that have gone back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, education, but it only represents like two, three percent of, of the population. No? So anyway, um, all these uh, actions have kind of, uh, which kind of, kind of began as uh, individual actions were slowly pushed together into kind of a, a joint policy at the university. And this allowed us to slowly have uh, a, um, an approach uh, uh, at, a, at, at an institutional level. No? And uh, our main objectives right now are to uh, continue with uh, governance support and uh, policy support at an institutional level with, uh, with Congress, with different ministries, in order for us to be able to um, uh, translate some of the sustainable and consumption policy measures we take in, in the campus and be able to uh, extend that first to Lima and then maybe to other cities in the country. Uh, this is especially important in sustainable mobility and transportation, which is uh, something that in which uh, Peru is lagging enormously. And then we also have some pending assignments uh, at our campus, no? uh, something in which we have not performed well and we need to improve in, in whenever we, uh, we, sorry, we come Jan, back. Can yeah. I suggest that you would cover uh, sort of the, the plants and uh, tentative barriers uh, in the question number four when we discuss so that we could uh, okay. go into more interactive, but you would have time to reflect on this, if it's okay. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Quickly, quickly finalize. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so anyway, uh, we, we do have some barriers that we have to overcome, but uh, we hope that with the multidisciplinary work with uh, within the university and also integrating new actors within the country, we will be able to overcome them and, and continue this path that we've initiated in the past decade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. And uh, colleagues, what is uh, remarkable uh, in this presentation is, uh, is of course, uh, an important element of, uh, uh, of uh, policy making uh, support, uh, which is done by the university, either through direct engagement of, uh, of the university uh, colleagues as policy advisors, I would imagine, or uh, by providing the policy makers this reliable information on uh, potential solutions uh, into the pro policy making processes. So that's, uh, that's clearly very important additional element on many other aspects which you shared. And of course, the whole question, Jan, of upscaling and bringing it from individual uh, knowledge product to, uh, to practices and uh, policy support, which hopefully would, uh, would provide a pivot to change the practices at a higher level is, is, is a remarkable um, innovation. Now, that brings us to the uh, end of the first part. And now we have uh, the four original questions which I shared with you. Uh, we will try to run through a few of them rather quickly. The first one of them uh, has been um, asking our participants to reflect on changes and innovations which ha have been made uh, in, their, uh, in their respective institutions. Uh, Isabel, we don't need it. I, I would try to rephrase it. Okay, so I think it, just it's to nice, yes, uh, call it back. It's but nice I think... to see people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it's, it's fine. So it was about ch uh, changes and innovations which universities um, undertook uh, to arrive at the uh, current stage where they uh, feel uh, as a part of uh, contributors into SDG 12. And I feel that uh, most of us already shared uh, these innovations to some extent, except Roger, potentially you. So may I just very briefly ask only you to quickly tell us what, what the University of Regina and uh, your college are doing in, ter in terms of um, uh, SDG 12, uh, particularly if you could uh, focus on the shared resources aspects, which in my view, incredibly exciting. And then we would move to other aspects uh, 
uh, which are which are touched by the panelists and being uh, and which are being asked already by the uh, by the uh, by the people online. Sure. So I think uh, a couple uh, str strategies at the University of Regina and at Luther College. One is open educational resources. So the fact is, if you want scholars thinking about sharing resources that cross the campuses, developing open textbooks for students that in, that include local examples uh, from, in our case, a Canadian context, a Saskatchewan context, in, in bringing in Indigenous knowledge as part of what is being taught in the classroom, that happens when you have open licensed textbooks that faculty are participating in and students are participating in. So we've had an open educational resource strategy uh, for a number of years now going, I think, at least back to 2010 with support from our provincial government. Uh, second one is our print optimization project, which basically uh, meant uh, trying to reduce the number of printers that were on campus so that each faculty member didn't have a printer in their office, but actually we had shared more efficient printers. Uh, we also encouraged reductions in the amount of printing on campus. And over a 10-year you know, period, that saved millions of dollars for the campus. It also, of course, uh, got a, faculty members to be much more conscious of their printing. And so uh, that, and, and so those are sort of the bread and butter activities of a university, a scholarly community, but it's really transforming the print, you know, the, um, the printing process uh, and the production of, of resources. And so now when we think about, well, how could we share lab equipment on campuses? How could we, how could we create repositories of equipment uh, which means treating the equipment almost autonomously in a real sense so that uh, you don't have one department you sort of hold, holding on to equipment that could be used by another department or so that communities as citizen scientists could be using equipment on campus. Those are sort of the next stages that we're working on. And of course, Roger, what you mentioned at the beginning, it's a sharing uh, the university grounds, uh, so to speak, for, for various uh, community related actions. Some other uh, uh, panelists also referred, uh, particularly Ross, you explicitly mentioned the, uh, the idea of, of sharing university ground resources, laboratories uh, for collaborative actions with the uh, community. So that, uh, that uh, would bring us to the second question, uh, which is uh, mostly concerned with uh, uh, with Agenda 2030 and uh, SDGs being used in the institutional strategy. But with your permission, dear colleagues, what I will do, I will slightly modify this um, question, uh, drawing from the question which is po posed by Stephanie. And she asked a rather difficult question in this regard. She asks, did SDGs help your university to strength to introduce or to strengthen the whole institution approach. So did it happen? So if somebody is ready to answer it right away, please you, you can just uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, and go ahead with this. So uh, Jan is already uh, ready. You can unmute yourself, Jan. Uh, for 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 the rest of us again while you speak, uh, let me repeat. The question, did SDGs help your university to strengthen, to introduce or to strengthen the whole institution approach? Jan, please, go ahead. Yeah, I, th I, I, I most certainly think that that, uh, that was definitely a trigger that, that helped us to, to strengthen our position uh, as, as a university. Uh, we were very disorganized in terms of the environmental science that was being uh, uh, push forward and uh, we also had a situation in which we were not really uh, channeling that science into supporting our students to build uh, new uh, competitive careers in, uh, uh, in the 21st century. You know? And I think that uh, SDGs, but not only SDGs, also the nationally determined contributions for climate uh, change in the Paris Agreement and other international uh, requirements no, that, uh, that have been uh, uh, shortly, uh, recently 
included no, in, in, in policy making has helped us to, uh, zoom out, have a look at the entire university, see what's going on in the different units. And uh, we've managed to build uh, like a, a pathway in which uh, certain actions are, are, built, uh, are built together. And I would say that this has also helped us to uh, reorganize uh, the funding opportunities. No? So uh, in Latin, Latin America, it's quite common. I, I know that in Europe, it's not so common, but in Latin, Latin America, it's quite common for universities to fund their own science, no? because uh, access to, uh, to external funds is not always as, a, as a succulent as it could be in, in Europe or in North America. So many times we are funding our own research and uh, this zoom out has also allowed us to uh, reorientate what uh, we are funding uh, in terms of environmental sciences, environmental engineering, etc. And I think overall we have include we've, we've, uh, we are now funding more research that is linked to sustainable development and goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Wonderful. So uh, I I see uh, Roger and Ross are ready to. Uh, to comment on this as well. After that, we will move to the next question. Please, Rose, if you could just unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much, Zineda. Actually, the SDG has enabled us to strengthen our institutional approaches to how we do things, particularly in our institution. And if you look at what we have been doing currently since when the SDGs came in, our institutions have realized how to work in a multidisciplinary manner, how to have many, you know, different uh, components within the institution that address the SDGs working together or departments. You might realize that institutions like where we are from, we have departments of health, we have social sciences, we have engineering, and all these have been brought on board in working in particular solving uh, community issues. And one key example at Moore University is we have a new curriculum that we have developed on MSc, and this is in MSc on sustainable energy and energy access. And if you look at this particular program, despite the fact that it is on energy, we have brought on board multidisciplinary aspects whereby we have people working on social aspects, so we have both soft and hard skills. So focusing on hard, soft skills that can enable the students achieve a whole rounded SDG focus is what we are doing in this curriculum. And we have students focusing on community sensitization on its own, particularly in relation to energy. Here we have social people. We have students focusing on the areas of entrepreneurship. So getting entrepreneurial skills and how to start businesses in relation to energy, you know, small, small things in energy. Also, we have people who are focusing actually on climate itself in relation to, you know, energy and energy access. So in one nutshell, we can say by coming up with this SDGs, it has strengthened the institution. And one other example is that at the university also, we have more universities and ISO 2015 certified institution. And here we are focusing on processes. And the all institution approach is brought in designing processes that can be followed by the institution in undertaking all processes. And this thing is followed by the students and at the same time, the faculty and all the support staff. And we have an office of ISO quality and quality assurance who normally now assists the, the units and the departments to ensure that all these matters that they have put in their procedures are being followed and well followed in order to be sustainable and to meet the SDG 2030. Thank you, Seneda, and back to you. Thank you Thank very you. much, Rose. Thank you. Uh, Roger, uh, please uh, take, uh, take the mic, take the floor. So I, I think one of the key things is combining local and global perspectives and knowledge together. And so when the University of Regina was uh, developing its latest strategic plan called All Our Relations, uh, it was a very grounded approach. There were 1,300 participants in developing that strategic plan, uh, faculty, students, alumni, staff. Uh, it was led by volunteers across the campus. And so from that process, which was very participatory, we ended up with five strategic areas uh, that we wanted to move the university. But we then used the sustainable development goals as a checklist in a way to make sure we weren't missing anything, right? This was a list of good questions to ensure that our strategic planning that had come from a grounded process 
also matched global priorities at the same time. And thankfully it did match up, uh, it worked very well. And now what we are doing is we're implementing that uh, through a strategic sustainability plan, uh, through again, voluntary working groups across the university where the SDGs are going to be are being used in considering our uh, our action areas in terms of ranking and what what we want to prior prioritize so uh, so that's how we're using them uh, thank you very much roger uh, so i i would like to ask professor Seda to to uh, to speak on the next question so and if you could integrate the sdg reflections also into this because it would be very it's a question which is very uh, much um, uh, relates to the uh, uh, to the question of um, uh, drivers for the whole institution uh, approach. You already spoke uh, about the students in taking sustainability on the ca campus. Perhaps you could uh, reflect on participation of some other uh, partners. But before I, I uh, turn the, not the floor, but the screen in this particular case to you, um, let me uh, remind us all the third question for the discussion. Uh, it originally is formulated as, as following, is your institution familiar with the whole institution approach? And how is this concept applied? However, from your presentations, it's very clear that it's it's applied already for a while. And so I am taking liberty now to again uh, borrow the question or modify the questions uh, inspired by uh, by our listeners, um, who is asking, uh, who are the main drivers in introduction of the whole institution approach? And I would let me expand it and also in uh, implementation of the SDGs in general and SDG 12 in particular? Would it be students? Would it be the top management? Uh, and what is the role of top, uh, top management? Uh, would it be some external uh, stakeholders? Would it be uh, the government or some other fund uh, givers? So where is the major internal and external driver uh, to, uh, to to bring uh, forward the whole institution approach towards implementation of SDGs and SDG 12. Uh, Professor Seydatou, may I just invite you to take the floor and I'm seeing who else would like to comment on it among our panelists. Thank you, um, Sinaida. Um, if you look at uh, the, the uh, governance of the university, when we talk about sustainability, it has always been a top-down approach whereby the university top management sets the goals and the agendas, and these are being followed by the administrators, academics, as well as the students. But recently, there has been a bit of transformative action to ensure that the sustainable living and the sustainable lifestyle is embedded within the environment of the university. So now it's more of a bottom-up approach. So it's either from the students' activities or the students' engagement, or it's from any other departments or any other academics from research or from any uh, external grants, consultation projects, or it's just initiative uh, in terms of uh, encouraging and uh, making sure that people are engaged in sustainability uh, lifestyle and sustainability engagement. On top of that, I would say as well, when you want to embed and when you want to uh, pr proceed with sustainability projects, engagement with outsiders are also important. For example, what we do here in uh, the Center of Global Sustainability Studies, we are now embarking on uh, setting up a center for recycling, education center for recycling, whereby we want to educate uh, the USM community on the proper ways of recycling. It may sound like a simple project, but uh, believe me, me, a lot of us do not actually know how and what is the proper way of recycling. So we are working with an NGO, the Suji Society in Penang, who are well-versed and who already have an education center for recycling. And this particular commitment is uh, a way for us to showcase that, you know, collaboration is important. And if you want to make sure that you have this awareness uh, being uh, advocated on the USM territory or USM environment, there must be a strong collaboration with uh, the outside community because you cannot do it alone. 
And when you talk about the uh, SDG framework, for example, uh, as what Roger has mentioned just now, it becomes our target. So now we know where we want to go. You know, we know that these are the things that we have to follow. And this is what I mentioned about the bottom up approach. So we have now started at CGSS uh, calculating our own uh, carbon footprint. We have not done this before because there was no urge and there was no urgency in measuring and calculating that. So uh, now with SDG uh, coming in, we have the targets. We know that we need to reduce our um, consumption of energy, consumption of water, you know, pollution. So we have that target. And we have started to do our environmental assessment at the university, trying to have to make sure that we have our baseline data. And we have started to do our monitoring on waste management, the amount of waste that was sent to the landfill, you know, the amount of energy consumption for the past years. So we want to track that. So if we don't have SDG goals as our targets, we may not know which direction we are going to and what we need to do. So the bottom up approach is very important as well because we are the one who knows the things. The researchers know what are the things that need to be done, but we also need the assistance and the help of a community around us, especially our industry partners. Take for example, we also had uh, in 2013, we had our first uh, pilot project on biogas. And this pilot project on biogas is a collaborative effort between uh, USM as well as one industry partner. So we managed to work together with the community, with the researchers as one of the key drivers, and then you know working together, um, making sure that we would be able to uh, form and to sustain our uh, living within the environment, within our means, as well as making sure that the targets of SDGs are being accomplished. Thank you, Zinaida. Thank you very much, Seda, too. So that brings us very quickly to the last point. And I do know, uh, Zetlev, that you have been typing the response uh, to this specific question in the chat. And I know that you have also some uh, additional ideas uh, to, to share, particularly on the processes and how they go uh, enabling the university to transform its nature to become more effective. So that gives me a perfect chance to bring you as a contributor to the last point, which has been uh, formulated as what are the opportunities and barriers you have encountered and how have you been taking advantage of those opportunities? So, but uh, rather than barriers and opportunities, just if you could focus on critical factors, a few of them, so that we could uh, turn uh, turn the floor to uh, to Ilich for the and to uh, Roger for final um, uh, summary. Uh, also, while you're gathering your thoughts, uh, well, uh, I would like to uh, mention uh, to our colleagues listening online that quite a lot of information also being shared by colleagues from IU and by the panelists through the Q&A panel, as well as through the chat. So please keep an eye on those. We all now are very capable to multitask online. So with this, Detlef, if you could just please give us some thoughts on the critical factors which transform the uni university and helping universities to transform the communities around, please. Yeah, yes, it's, uh, I... Mm prepared my short um, presentation, which lasted uh, a little bit longer. I, mm, I thought about um, SDG 12 products and processes and asked myself, um, which are, what are the main products um, uh, universities create? And uh, let me make a rough suggestion. Um, uh, these are five uh, products. It's research in order to produce knowledge, courses, study, study programs in order to providing or imparting knowledge, certificates and diplomas in order to assess knowledge, and designing uh, learning environments in order to try out knowledge. And uh, last but not least, the fifth is uh, networks, networks of actors uh, in order to build discourse arenas. And if this could be an idea, these are the main uh, products of uh, universities, then we could ask which are 
uh, what are the processes behind. And uh, then I find it very helpful, um, the concept of the value chain, uh, uh, which is um, uh, uh, worked out by, um, by um, Porter. Uh, this value change uh, make a difference between the primary processes and the secondary processes or the primary activities and the secondary activities. And what I see is uh, that uh, in universities, we often start with the secondary activities, with the supporting materials uh, and uh, sustainable green food and, and so on. And step by step, we come closer to the uh, um, to the products which make up the, uh, the universities. And, uh, and uh, then we could uh, focus on, uh, on these uh, primary uh, activities. And uh, for example, uh, how could we make certificates and diplomas that our students have uh, have got uh, competences and deepen their competences on sustainable development? On sustainable lifestyle, that's an interesting uh, question, and uh, I saw it in uh, in the chat that uh, someone asked uh, uh, is this, uh, about laws and uh, um, uh, and so on. Yes, and I think we have to uh, to uh, to look at this or uh, the design of learning environments means that we have to uh, look upon the didactics uh, of each uh, study programs and so and that goes to the core of the university yeah and so i my strategy to uh um uh, to face the challenge okay we Jatlip, we uh, we lost you Uh, that if we, we lost uh, connection with you. Uh, hello. I, that if, that if we, we, the connection is hello. not very good. Uh, maybe the best is, uh, yeah. may I just suggest that you would quickly try to, uh, in a couple of sentences, summarize. Uh, clearly, video takes too much resources. Yeah. And then uh, uh, potentially we can conclusion continue. conclusion is to start yeah. with... Zetlev, there is no contact. Okay. Uh, colleagues, I think that we lost Zetlev now. Uh, however, the uh, the ideas which Zetlev is sharing is are definitely worth it to explore potentially through uh, Illich uh, publication, which you are inviting uh, the panelists as well as participants to contribute to. Perhaps you can explicitly later mention uh, this, um, because clearly uh, the idea, strategic uh, idea to move from concept and core essential uh, work of the universities to some ambitious agenda of what Jan is uh, calling domino set of activities to make really transition uh, and position universities uh, much more powerfully in this transition would be a very good idea. So uh, with this, let me just um, uh, conclude by saying that clearly we see that higher education community has proven, uh, has already proven portfolio of practices and very clear aspirations to take much greater role in supporting transitions for for uh, towards sustainable development in this particular case uh, through SDG 12. And there is understanding of complexities, ability to assess the net results of different activities, positive as well as negative. There is clear experience in innovation and putting these innovations into practices and also commitment to overcome barriers, um, which might have been slowing this uh, transition. So uh, what we are seeing saying here, I guess, collectively and many partners behind us that universities are ready 
And uh, Ilich, I'm sure you and Roger now would speak about the role of uh, International Association uh, of University. But for me, uh, you clearly gives us an important platform con to consolidate practices, not only among those universities uh, which are around, but also with partners that uh, then look for higher education inputs. So with this, let me thank very much uh, our panelists for excellent contribution, for opening incredibly important questions, for sharing your, uh, your insights, and uh, turn the floor to uh, first Roger, who, who is the coordinator of this uh, cluster on the everyday basis. Roger, please. Uh, I too would like to thank my colleagues uh, this morning and uh, or <laughs> morning Saskatchewan time. I also want to mention uh, Jocelyn Crivia, who's the co-lead from the University of Regina for our subcluster on uh, SDG 12. Uh, she has played a central role in moving this along and has joined us also virtually this morning. Um, I think the other thing I want to just mention is the value of the cluster in terms of creating, uh, you know, lightweight structures that help our universities to focus on the SDGs, in particular responsible consumption and production. So this is just one example of a fairly lightweight structure that can have substantial impacts. Uh, as Nada, you mentioned, the RCEs, Regional Centers of Expertise, provide that lightweight structure that brings universities and communities together. And within our campuses too, I know the University of Regina has a President's Advisory Committee on Sustainability, but again, a very lightweight structure that convenes decision makers uh, and also allows for that grassroots participatory uh, 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 movement, I would say, within universities. Because as we embrace responsible consumption and production and sustainable livelihoods and lifestyles, that's going to transform what it means to be a scholar on campus, what it means to be educated. <laughs> and, and that in turn will transform our campuses even further in terms of our governance structures, in terms of our resource sharing, our commitments to our communities and our local ecosystems. And even, I mean, this is the high level political forum, really how as, as humans, as a human species, we connect politically to other species on this planet in a way that isn't destructive, but in a way that is in harmony with those larger systems. So, so I think we can expect very good things of universities in the years to come uh, as leaders for our communities. I think for our political leadership globally, we need to think about how we respect in this time of transition, university autonomy and freedom so that we can make the bold moves in terms of sustainable production and consumption, the new transformative and dis perhaps disruptive technologies that the planet is asking for right now. Um, and I think with universities, uh, there's been a lot of change that's been very disruptive uh, recently in terms of COVID, but I think now universities are going to provide a lot of really positive changes uh, that everyone can be looking forward to in working with our communities at local and regional levels and globally. So uh, thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Hillage to just point to a few things that are happening this fall that are very exciting. Thank you very much. I see we're running out of time, but the discussion was so uh, passionate and, and interesting that it was difficult to stop it anyway. I see that we still have a, a very good group of participants with us. Some of, of you had to leave, uh, but others are still with us. Thank you very much for the excellent presentations made, for the very good uh, examples given on how universities actually work on SDG 12 and how they connect to all the others. I think, Ian, you had a very good mapping all the different uh, other SDGs this relates to. Uh, Rose, you, you really touched on essential, very practical sides as well, how universities can address uh, societal challenges. Uh, similarly, um, um, and Detlev, you showed how a university actually came to work uh, together across disciplines and across uh, the campus so on on uh, and and from usm how the actually the the very philosophy of a university of, in a garden is still a very uh, big reality today um, i've been there a few times and and can only remember so i would also like to all of you uh, thank you for helping us travel the world despite lockdown
down and then no physical traveling, but to go to your different campuses. And I would like to thank you in particular, uh, Roger, for uh, chairing uh, together with Jocelyn Crivea this uh, excellent work on SDG 12 to, to keep it alive, to, uh, to make it something resonate with so many different realities around the world. And thank you certainly also for your last comments where you uh, raised the importance of the ethical dimensions of the work that you do and also the value-based higher education that is so much needed for the future. You insisted on academic freedom, on university autonomy, and uh, those are definitely essential for allowing the higher education community from leadership to students, to staff, to the administrators, to all those working in and, and um, within the university and without um, or outside with the different communities to work together in, um, in, in respect of those different values and ethical dimensions. You also all talked about something else that is so important, it's this example setting of the university. And the university is a, is a universe in itself, and thus it's a world in itself that can actually um, uh, resonate with the world outside by giving examples of how things can, can be done uh, differently in, in our society today. And you all raised the notion of our responsibility. It's a personal responsibility, but it's a shared responsibility of us all together as well. And those dimensions um, you illustrated uh, wonderfully. So I would like to very warmly thank you for that. And then I maybe have one minute to say that yes, um, this series um, of webinars um, is very much related to the UNHLPF and also resonates with the whole discussion that is so important nowadays uh, with the um, important U UNESCO and UN conferences happening and, try and which are actually contributing to redrafting a roadmap for higher education. So all your voices are essential in that. Already uh, we were very instrumental in debating these issues at the UNESCO World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development which was uh, also uh, mentioned by uh, Saida Tool uh, and by, by all of you for that matter. And we're moving now towards May 2022 when UNESCO will hold its UNESCO World Higher Education Conference. In that conference as well, the voices uh, of, uh, of, of all of you and your work will resonate very strongly and we will make sure that uh, that, that is um, uh, definitely taken on board uh, when, when the drafting of the roadmap to 2030 will be, um, uh, will be developed and also when discussions will start on the roadmap to 2050 because already there are discussions for obviously way beyond. So thank you very much for all these different dimensions. Zinaida, excellent moderation. Uh, thank you for all who have uh, helped um, uh, develop this session. In particular, thank you to my colleague uh, Isabel, who's been instrumental in all this all through the year and for this session in particular. And I think we will continue in the fall with um, sessions on the digital transformation of higher education, sessions on leadership, where we go, on uh, higher education research for sustainable development, and also on rethinking internationalization, one of the uh, key areas of higher education that has been um, seeing many transformations, especially now, and uh, where we will match the opportunities uh, uh, against uh, all the challenges we faced. And in the chat, I invited many of you to consider contributing a paper on this importance of leadership, but leadership at many different levels of the institution, as you have shown. And hopefully many of you will be interested to contribute a paper to uh, the upcoming issue of IAU Horizons, the magazine that comes out twice a year. And this time we'll be focusing specifically on HESD. So thank you for your wonderful work, for uh, your dedication to, the, to, this, uh, to this important topic um, of SDG 12. You've shown, as was announced in the beginning by Roger, that this is a cross-cutting uh, SDG that is supporting all the others. You are right, <laughs> you showed it once again. 
So thank you. And on top of that, you should all know that Roger is on holidays officially, and he, even though he's with us. <laughs> so thank you. Have a, a wonderful time um, over the summer, I hope, or winter for those who for, for, whom, for whom it is already winter. And thank you again for your wonderful contributions to uh, this important conversation today. Thank you. Goodbye.